Um, we have several profiles that evaluate a patient's toxic exposure or exposure to various um, environmental things. Um, you know, we're not really measuring body burden. I think that's really important to note, but we're assessing your actual exposure. So how should a clinician decide which tests to order? Because, you know, we have urine testing, we have blood testing. Um, how do you decide? Yeah, it's a great it's a great point. And the point you made initially is the fact that this is exposure, not necessarily body burden is important. And it's not going to tell you, you know, I was exposed to mercury when I was four years old. These are fairly recent exposures. And it depends, you know, what time frame you're looking at. If we're talking about the urine, um, the urine ordinarily gives a fairly recent exposure, 24 to 48 hours, depending on the toxin we're talking about. Um, and so you take into account that time frame and the urinary evaluation for exposures of toxins. There are standalone profiles called the toxic elements clearance profile, which measures 20 various urinary toxins that you may have been exposed to. There's the comprehensive urine elements profile, which combines that with some urinary nutrients that may have been wasted in the, in the meantime. But both of those profiles can also be added on to our new metabolomics plus profile, which is a at home collection, non-invasive nutritional profile. So it's a way to, to add to, you know, look at your nutritional status and then get a feel for your urinary toxic exposures. But that brings us to blood, Michael. Yeah. From a blood standpoint, what we're thinking about is we've got a little bit of a longer window of time, right? We think about the life cycle of a red blood cell and that tends to be somewhere between 90 and 120 days. And so what we're doing on something like the NutriVal where we, you can do the add-on for uh, toxic elements on the NutriVal, that's a whole blood assessment. Whole blood is gonna be a combination of red blood cell and serum, right? So it's, it's hard to go to understand exactly what that window of time is. I tend to put it at around maybe like a month or so because you're combining the serum, which turns over every couple of weeks and you're combining the red blood cell. Um, but that gives a little bit of a longer window of exposure time. So if you wanna look and say, okay, maybe over the course of the last month or so, what has my patient been exposed to? Then that's, uh, that might be where I would opt for something like the NutriVal with the add-ons for the toxic elements, or if you just wanted to do that individually, there's the elemental analysis profile. I mean, the only downside to that is, right, it's a little bit more invasive. It requires a blood draw. So um, that's a little bit of that uh, negotiation that from a clinical ordering standpoint, you might want to have. And so with our urine testing at Genova, you have the option of ordering it to be ratioed to volume or a ratio to creatinine. Can you guys go into that in a little bit more detail? Like, why would I consider one over the other? And with retesting, what, you know, do I keep the same methods or do I change that? Like, can you guys just kind of go over that a little bit? Yeah, so you can, like Lenore said, you can just do, you know, a timed collection, just one first morning void, which would be, ratio to your creatinine as a standardization. You can do 24 hours, collect all of your urine or a significant amount of time and they ratio it to volume. I think important to note is that, you know, one timed collection is usually fairly good for most people. Um, and some people use it in, in a way when they start to treat with chelation, they'll do a, a one time first morning void, give some type of chelating agent and then repeat the test. So some people use it that way. Important to note was your second point, where if you are repeating a test, just try to see if something is cleared. We try to go apples to apples, right? Instead of, you know, one is ratio to volume, one's ratio to creatinine. So that's an important point. But Michael, anything else you want to add to that? No, I agree. I mean, I think in general, my understanding of it is that historically, there was a lot of protocols that worked with a 24-hour collection. And so that's where the, kind of the origins of the ratio to volume came from. Um, and then if you're doing smaller windows of time, then it becomes necessary to ratio to creatinine because we have to account for the dilution of the urine sample. And so I think in general, it's, a, it's just a general rule. It tends to be prudent to, to order ratio to creatinine because you're not always going to know one, with 100% certainty the window of time that the patient is going to collect. Um, and so you cover all your bases by doing that. But that being said, I think there's there's a lot of clinicians that are that have a very specific protocol that they're used to following, and that includes the 24-hour. Uh, the
And in terms of management, right, somebody who comes back and we see that they have a high level of, let's just use mercury for today's conversation, how do you really manage it? I know for me, I, I try to be very basic. I'm like, where is it coming from? Decrease exposure, eliminate exposure, antioxidants, and get it out of the body. Like, how do you guys like to approach it? Exactly that. We're looking to see you, you, a little bit of detective work, right? Where is this coming from? What's that source? And minimize or completely eliminate it. We often send clinicians to the CDC website, the ATSDR, which kind of lists each environmental toxin specific possible places you may be exposed to these things. So I think you're right. First and foremost, you need to investigate where is this coming from and do your best to eliminate it. Was it food? Is it water? Is it your soil? You know, just look, is it your cosmetics? Is it supplements you're taking? All of these are very common sources of toxins that people don't think about. And then even, you know, we talk about supporting detoxification. So how would, how do you do that, Michael, support detox? Yeah, I mean, I think about the sink analogy, right? The body is always kind of evaluating what's coming in and then what's draining out of the sink. And the more that you can limit what's coming into the sink in the form of mercury, the more your body is going to be able to drain the sink with its detoxification capacity. So, you know, first and foremost is the reduction from the exposure standpoint. From the elimination standpoint or the detoxification standpoint, you know, there's lots of things in our functional medicine toolkit that we could use. You know, I tend to, instead of, I, you always meet the patient where they're at. Um, you know, some patients might be a little bit more ready gung-ho to, to, to take on more of a strict detox, and we can talk about the inclusion of different types of intermittent fasting or things like that. Um, but at the end of the day, your diet is your detox, right? Like what is coming in is what is allowing your body to have the adequate nutrition to do its regular detoxification. And sure, things like leafy green vegetables, things like parsley, celery, cilantro, things like that are, are well known as being a little bit more effective from a chelation of heavy metal standpoint and detoxification. But at the end of the day, um, it's all about what your lifestyle is. And that is, that's going to translate into how well the sink is drinking. I also would check in with the gut, you know, consider a stool test just to make sure the gut's moving. You want to look specifically at something like beta glucuronidase, which in essence would just recirculate toxins back into the enteric circulation. So, you know, these are all things that you can do to support a patient who has some type of a toxic exposure. But I think we all agree, look for the source first and let's just turn and off dietary. the paint. Turn off the Dietary water. To too. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Because that's going to ultimately bind, right? That's phase three detoxification. Yep. That's going to be what's responsible for binding up uh, all those things that you're detoxifying, making sure they're carried out of the system. That's right. Absolutely. And then I also like to throw in there too, um, genetics, right? Sure. There's going to be some people who are just predisposed to having lower glutathione levels to having problems with clearing things like um patty you brought up beta glucuronidase um you know that might be an example of that too because there is a gene link to that g-u-s-b i believe it is but um you know we also have to be mindful of what is their methylation capabilities because there is an aspect of methylation required for detoxification so there are a bunch of other things that you know we can look into as well like how is your cyp3a4 enzyme system working and other things like that so i think that's also important to um, look into as well or help to support when you're managing a patient who has toxic exposure